All right, everyone, welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Greg Hellback, and today I have my buddy Rob Chavez out of the DMV, which is the, what is that, D.C., Maryland, Virginia? Is that what that stands for? That's it, man. You That's got right. It. Yeah, Rob's uh, one of my fellow mastermind members in the Multipliers, which is, in my opinion, the best mastermind in the game for high-level entrepreneurs. So I met Rob down in Tulum a couple months ago. He, that was like three or four months ago now. Time flies, dude. I dude, it flies. It. It's crazy. Crazy, it's right? Yeah, so we, we, we chopped it up down in Tulum. We were able to hang out a bunch. And uh, I was a guest on his show, and I figured he'd be a great guest for our show. So, Rob, I'm really looking forward to kind of getting into your your backstory and what you're doing uh, in the real estate business because you got some great stuff going on there down in the, the DMV area. So before we get into the real estate stuff, you know, tell me a little bit about your background. Like, what were you like as a kid? How'd you grow up? And we'll kind of get your story. Yeah, man. Uh, so my, my dad was, uh, I was born in Argentina, right? Okay. Uh, my dad was a diplomat for the U.S., and I don't even remember Argentina. I saw, I've seen pictures. Like I was there for six months. Yeah. Then we came to Virginia because that's kind of like home base for everybody. Then I was there yeah. for about six months. Then we moved to Costa Rica and I was in Costa Rica for four or five years. And that's what I start remembering, right? I start remembering Costa, yeah, Costa Rica. Yeah, yeah. I love Costa Rica. It's a great place. My little sister was born there. She's a Tika, right? And, um, and dude, we, my dad was a, a diplomat for the US. So I literally every three, four years, I would, you know, um, we moved to a different country. I think I, I attended something like 14 schools by the time, 14, 15 schools by the wow. time I, I graduated high school. Um, and dude, I, I loved it. Like, I, I gotta be honest with you. Like, I really liked it. Like it, it was the way to reinvent yourself every single time. Yeah. I was, right? like, I was like, new set of, new set of friends, new set of girls, new reinvention. Oh, right. The best. <laughs> it was a good time. Um, but you know, I lived in places like, uh, Australia, El Salvador, you know, Tijuana, Costa Rica, Texas, California, like a bunch of places. So super blessed, super fortunate to, to live that, uh, didn't grow up in an entrepreneur's household. Um, you know, but I, I, I was, I, I had a little bit of that when I was younger in Costa Rica, I remember selling mangoes to the older kids yeah. and then they put the kibosh on it. Cause I was climbing trees, two stories too high. They put the kibosh, but but our household was not an entrepreneur's household, but my parents to their fortune would always talk about real estate because we were always moving, right? Yeah. We always had to find a house and make that our home. And, and along the way, they would buy property in these countries and then fix them up. And, and I got to experience that like wall, like tearing down the wallpaper and painting and stuff like that from an early age. So I think maybe those were some early seeds that were planted. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, in wrestled in high school, you know, wrestled D1 in college. And, um, you know, that, I think that kind of focused my brain a little bit about, hey, I like competition. I like benchmarking against people. And, you know, that was it, man. Sounds like the perfect uh, recipe to be an entrepreneur. Competition, measuring yourself, you know, having incentives. Sounds like the, the route of an entrepreneur to me. You, you know, there's a lot of failing forward in, in, in wrestling, right? You get your ass yeah. kicked and then you got to get back yeah. up and figure out like what happened? How do I fix that? What do I do? So, you know, I, uh, I got lucky. What, what got me in the business originally was there was a donor to the university that uh, was super wealthy and um, he would come in every week and work out. And he was, he was around my weight class. Yeah. And I, I was like, who is this older guy? That's like just a total stud. And, um, and I, I came to find out that he was super successful business owner, hundreds of millions of dollars, like type of guy. And he, yeah. um, he took me under his wing and he gave me a job while I was in college and wow. essentially put me in his accounting department, which I totally sucked at, but I, <laughs> you know, but I just wanted exposure. Uh, I had a, a, my accounting teacher actually paired me up with him and um, and when I graduated from college, he said, what, what are you going to do with your life? I, I was like, I'm going to go start a business, right? He's like, well, what are you going to do right now? And I was like, I don't know. And he's like, come work for me. And then I, I worked for him in sales um, on the um, insurance, he owned an insurance business. Like, and I worked for him for about a year, so a year and a half in college, a year out of college. And then my best friend and I started a, um, he really started it, showed me that he could make money in it but we started a recruiting business out of his bedroom, placing tech salespeople in the early, in the late nineties, like 1998, right. Right before the dot com as the dot com boom was occurring. Yeah. Right? The internet was starting to become a real thing. People didn't think it was created by Al Gore or some. Crazy yeah. Thing. Yeah. That's right. It was yeah. like, you know, pet 
Topia or something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. It's like, what com. the hell? Yeah. And so, anyhow, we were making a lot of money at a really young age. Yeah. And um, I just happened to read the book Rich Dad Poor Dad, like so many people, right? <laughs> And that, and that book took me down a journey of, of buying real estate investments for passive income. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I got punched in the face, man. Um, got punched in the face. The dot-com boom turned to bust, right? Which was yeah. a difficult time. Went from making, you know, high six figures to, to like very little money, right? In that business. Uh, in 2002, right? 9-11 happened. 2002 was like somebody turned off the spigot. But what kept me alive, man, was if I needed a little bit of money. And by the way, my daughter was born in 2002. So you got to picture this. I just got done buying uh, a, a single family house. I just got done look pretty in, in during that time. It seemed like a lot of money. Now I look back, I'm like, it wasn't that much money, but interest rates right. were, interest rates were completely different, right? Interest rates were like six and a half. My little girl was just born. My wife wasn't working, you know, and I, I went from making, you know, high six figure salary to, to like literally like very little money. I, my income got cut by like, you know, 75%. Holy dude. That is scary. When you got kids, I would be freaking out, dude. Yeah. I, I was, and, and I, I wasn't necessarily, I, I, I think back and I was like, I was just going to figure out a way, right. Yeah. To make it yeah. work. But if we needed a little bit of money and, I, I would sell a house that I'd purchased along the way. Yeah. And remember during that time, it was like no income, no doc. So if you had good credit and you had money for a down payment, you could just buy a townhouse and the, the real estate market was running up kind of like how it's running up a little bit. Kind right of like now. now. Right? <laughs> it, was, it was running up. Yeah. And so if I needed, you know, some money, I would sell a house yeah. and I'd put that in my pocket. And so we weathered that storm and that business got back on track. But by 2005, I was done with it, right? I was like in love yeah. with real estate. And I asked my business partner to buy me out so I could pursue real estate full time. So you got right into it. You jumped right into the game, out of the, out of the recruiting business, into the real estate business, full time, full willy nilly, going at yeah. it. Yeah, no plan, no system, no mentor, no anything. Oh yeah, the Nothing. good way. No, no clue, no clue, oh, no clue. Gosh. Literally, I don't recommend it for everybody. It was like, just like a gut feeling. I was said, I don't belong in this seat anymore recruiting. Yeah. I feel like my life is on the real, on the side of real estate. Um, and I just approached my wife one day and I said, I think I, I think I want to buy apartment buildings. <laughs> that was the, that was it. I want to go buy apartment buildings. Yeah. And yeah. The, the motivation was this in the world of recruiting, you start very much like being an agent, right? You, or, or wholesaler even a rehabber. I mean, for the most part, you're starting every month at zero. Yeah. That's the problem with freaking flipping dude that I yeah. realized after five years and doing a lot of deals, it's yeah. the same shit. You can make 200 G's one month and the next month you're like, fuck, I got to put that damn mail back out, you know? Yeah. 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 And Crazy. so what happens, so what happens is you realize that that's just all earned income, right? Whether you're yeah. a flipper, you're in construction, you're an agent, you're a wholesaler, it's all the same. And the whole idea is to take that cash and buy assets that will pay you long-term. Yes. And so that light bulb went off, right? For me, um, two or three years into it, as I was flipping houses, right? Like and fixing, we, like taking projects down, renovating and dumping them retail and then exiting. Yeah, and what, and what we were doing was we we realized that that the market where we were in Northern Virginia, everything seemed completely inflated. Oh, it's so me, expensive right? down there, yeah. But there was a little town a couple hours away from where we were that hadn't experienced the same boom yeah. And, um, and it was more of a cash flow type of area, at least on paper, it looked like a cash flow yeah. area, uh, kind of a depressed little area. And what we would do is we'd go in, send thousands of letters. People would call me and negotiate deals. And that's really yeah. where I cut my teeth, man. You know, yeah. buying like $50,000 dupl duplexes. Oh yeah. The good you know, old. Yeah. And, do and doing that. And then what, what happened was I learned how to negotiate at the table. I learned how to raise capital. I learned how to yeah. renovate properties. And then I would sell these assets, typically duplexes, triplexes, quads, to other investors, turn key. And then they would turn around and say, well, this is great, but who's going to manage it for us? And I'm like, well, we don't want to manage it. We live two hours away. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, listen, no. the only way we're going to do this is if you manage it. So my wife decided, well, we manage our own assets, right? We, we already had 
a number of assets, we how much harder could it be, right? Oh, sure. I know. And so, so before we knew it, man, in a year and a half, we had 300 assets under management. <sighs> I know. And 300 and, human being tenants with eyes yes, and ears. Oh. Yes. And my wife ran that side of the business. And the Dude. way I look, I mean, there's so many learning lessons. Let me tell you, I'll give you some of the nuggets. But, you know, remember, we're two hours away from where we live. So we had the run of, of office. There was, you know, physically property management. you got to be there. So yeah, boots on the find ground. Find yeah. somebody, had to find people there, run that office. This is low income, average rents, 500, 550 bucks, 10%, it's only 50 bucks a door. I mean, we didn't put it through a performa, dude. It was like a yeah. nightmare, but, but we were just getting our reps in, like getting yeah. our reps in, right? And, yeah. uh, and the way I saw it was almost like it was a lost leader. Like it helped me dispose of the asset because we'd be like, hey, yeah, I'd sell it. I'd make money when I sold the asset and then yeah. we would manage it. And, you know, yeah. we were hoping that we would, you know, make a little bit of money on the management side. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's what, that's what, that's how we started, man. Um, making every mistake under the sun, but there's no better way to learn. That's you know? how you really get the experience. And I'm glad you made that point because everyone wants like the secret code they can read in a book. And I read a lot of books. I'm sure you do too. I see your shelf behind you and you see yeah. mine, but it's like, that's like, that's like, uh, you're going to learn some stuff in a book, but when you're actually doing the damn work, that's where you're going to really, it's where you, it's going to. It's like your brain weight, like your your group, like you really can connect the dots when you're actually doing it. And then the thing you learn in the book will just help you a little bit, you know? It's better than That's watching right. TV, in my opinion. 100%. It's you like know? you don't fully get it until you're yeah, in it, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you're it's doing like, that. So you made a shift eventually. So you, you the reason I really, I think this is a great, well, this is definitely a great interview because you're a great guy, but your business model is very different. The way that you, the sequence of events in your career so far is different than a lot of the other guests we've had on because they start as an agent or something like that. And they, um, they become investors after that, you know? So you actually did the opposite. You started as an investor yeah. and then you became an agent after that. You became an agent after that. So yeah. what was the reason behind that? Because it's a smart strategy and you made a good point before we hit record on like a lot of times you can make more money in commissions with less, you know, BS than wholesaling. Cause I've done a lot of wholesale deals and they get crazy. Yeah. Well, you know, what happened was I realized that, um, remember this town is two hours away from where we live. Right. Um, this was 2008 now and everything in our backyard at this point, remember I left this market in 2005 saying everything is overpriced. And I, and I cut my teeth in this town from 2000, you know, 2005 to 2008. And then in 2008, I looked up and everything in our backyard was on sale. Right. Assets that were valued at like 350 were now a buck 50. And, and so it, that transition period started happening, happening for me when I came back to the Nova area. Yeah. And I, I picked up a number of assets with a business partner. Remember, nobody was giving a recently self employed guy, real estate guy, yeah. Yeah. money in 2008 as yeah. Lehman Brothers is going bankrupt. Right. Yeah. But I developed all this, all this this muscle of being able to buy an asset, fix an asset, put tenants into an asset. And I happened to have a friend that, that had some cash. And I just happened to mention to him, Hey man, these things peaked at like three fifty. that you can pick them up at like a buck 50. The rents are 1500 bucks a month. It's a 1% yeah. rule. Haven't seen this mark in this market ever. I'm looking at the MLS. And so, so what would happen is I I'd gotten my license a year earlier, purely to just get like referral fees. Yeah, I, yeah. I would I would make send out thousands of letters. People would call me. I'd get all these retail leads. Couldn't yeah. do anything with them. I'd refer them to an agent. The agent would say, I'd say, hey, can I get a referral fee? They're like, no, not unless you're technically licensed. So that's what prompted me to get the license, right? So in 2008, now I've got my license. This market, every house is a foreclosure. So I'm just yeah. entering in as an agent, looking at them, acquiring them for ourselves. But then I got the idea of. Um, you know, like I, I'm like, I can't take all these down myself. And I started organizing foreclosure bus tours, right? I was running an investment group, a little investment group in, in my backyard at the time. And I said, listen, if you wanna, if you wanna see what it's like to walk through a foreclosed house, show you how I'm buying these houses, showing you what the numbers look like, join me on this day at this time. And I yeah. pack a bus with like 30 people, right? And we School would- School bus or a coach bus? No, like a, like a, yeah, like a school bus, like a coach bus, but I mean, yeah, yeah I know what you're saying. Like, yeah. I mean, it was big, right? Yeah, yeah. And then we would, and then we would go by these houses 
and we would, I, and I would give people an education and be like, Hey, this is why I like this one. This is what it looks like. This is what yeah. the renovation would cost. And, and I started building a network and people just started saying, Hey, can you help me buy something? Can you help me sell something? Right. Yeah. And I remember a friend of mine who was a developer at the time, remember this 2008. Yeah. He's selling a luxury home in Arlington, Virginia, which you and I were just high end trying to sell it for like 1.7, somewhere around there. Holy the market, cow. his agents weren't getting it done. The market was sliding at the time, right? Yeah. He was about to start losing money on this project. And he said, Hey, you know, I know you got your license. Maybe you, you can help me, or maybe you can refer me to somebody that can help me. Yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm, I, I'm, I'm about to start losing big money on this project. I looked at it, I analyzed the deal and I'm like, man, I, you got to get out now. The market is shifting downwards. Yeah. This is where I think it needs to be. I think I said like a million six or a million six, five, got a contract in like 20 days, went to settlement. And I remember I walked away from the table with like a big check, right? Yeah. Like a wholesale and I, check, like the yeah, guru check. And I, and I was like, wait a second, right? I got to work with a friend on a product that I really liked because it was a nice luxury deal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I took no risk right? No risk at no all risk. until it sells. No freaking equitable no, interest or any BS, man. No risk, right? And and I was like, I need to do more of this, right? Yeah. And around that time, I started realizing that, listen, you got in this game anyways to build passive income. And all you're doing is buying these really good assets. And then you're selling these really good assets for cash. You're killing the golden goose. What are you doing, man? Like you're like, by God, this is not why you got into this business. Yeah. You got into this business buy assets, right? And, and getting my license gave me permission to be able to sell it and a, a real estate asset and not feel guilty about it. Dude, I love that. And right? it's more, way more scalable because there's less capital required on the, on the you know, because it's especially on the like, reno side because I was renovating everything, right? Oh, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Flipping is crazy. You have to, the thing I've noticed with flipping is like, it's so risky. If you really like look at flipping, like from a legitimate perspective, it's like yeah. the only way you can make your 50, 60 grand is if you invest like a shitload of money. And then that's where your revenue comes from. It's like, oh, if there's a profit with a brokerage business, it, se it seems from my perspective to scale a lot better because you're, it's a service-based business versus a capital intensive, you know, risk reward business. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? That's like my yeah. you, I mean, you could turn it off or turn it off, turn it on, turn it off very quickly, yeah. right? Like, yeah, just like, like, a wholesaling business, right? You could say, yeah. "Hey, I don't want to send any any spend yeah. any money marketing," yeah. right? Totally. Um, but when you're renovating a house, you're stuck in projects. Oh, you're jammed up. You gotta yeah. finish the project. So if you've got a lot of projects going on at once. I, I've seen a lot of people in the market start sliding five percent, ten percent. You're carrying a lot of product. You can get yourself in a lot of trouble, right? You start compounding that. And what yeah. happens also with renovating a lot of houses at the same time, you know unless you're a real good operator from a project management standpoint, you start becoming really inefficient. You're not getting those projects done quickly. Yeah. Right? You, you haven't understood. You don't understand how to like efficiently do it. Right. Yes. I mean, you can, you can build yourself into it, but you're going to make a lot of mistakes along the way. Right. And, um, and that's why you've seen a lot of major players in our area um, that have become, they've gone from rehabbing houses, a hundred, 200 re rehab houses here yeah. to saying, you know what, screw that. We're just going to be wholesalers and we're going to stop renovating totally. and we're just going to do the wholesale business, right? Because they understood, oh, the, you know, the trailing liability also is a lot less, right? What do you mean by trailing liability? Well, when you, when you renovate a house and you sell it to a consumer, yeah. right? if God forbid you didn't do things right, if you didn't pull permits, right? Like yeah, there's yeah, yeah. trailing liability associated with that renovation that you okay. did, right? People come come back to you after the fact and said, you didn't disclose this. I didn't know about this. You didn't pull the permit for this. And I've seen a lot of investors get, you know, screwed, not screwed. They did the wrong thing and they got whacked for doing the wrong yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. After, after the fact, after, after the, the money fact. was in the bank. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so. Um, That's so true. <laughs> and, then I, and then I had to take a self-assessment of my own personality. And I was like, you know, I'm more of a, I don't like taking a lot of risk, Right. Um, I felt like renovating and doing more development work was taking a lot of risk. It is, yeah. Baby girls, she's little. And I wanted to, I'm like, I, I, I totally get the fee for service thing, right? I sell a house, I make my, I sell a house, I make cap money come yeah. from the bank. And, and ultimately my model be, became like, I sell a house and as, and I'm going to buy with 
the money that's left over after paying our bills and everything, we're going to use that to buy real estate assets. And that, yeah. became, that became our model, right? And that's the model I teach agents. And that's the model I teach, you know, what I call the agent investor. And, and um, because dude, we're in the same business. If you're a wholesaler and I'm a listing agent, right? We're in the same business. Same we're, just thing. Tar- we're just targeting two different avatars. That's totally. it. Right? Totally. It's so true. And it's the it's same, same intention. Thing. Transactional real estate is transactional real estate. It's transactional real estate. It's just Dude. different audience, right? Totally. So once you're clear on that, then I had to make a decision. And this is interesting. Who did I want to be in the world of real estate? Like I was like, do I want to be viewed as the investor? Like I remember sitting down, this was a decade ago. Now back in my area, right? Or do I want to be, do I want to look at, do I want to be viewed as the broker who understands investments? Right. Mm. And, and I could sell luxury development and I, and I have contacts in that world. Yeah. And because I owned a recruiting business before, remember all, I have all this network of, of guys that were really successful. And so, yeah. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, I can, I can leverage that network in order to do a lot of brokerage business. Right. And so I just ultimately said, I can, I ultimately, I'm an investor at heart. And I, what I'm really doing is I'm building a business as an agent. And I look at it as a business so that I can generate cash. So I can buy investments, right? Smart. It's yeah. super smart. And that's a lot of people, they just, they, they're so stuck on being a fix and flipper or a wholesaler. And, I, and that's what I do. I mean, that's my career, you know, and it's great. Yeah. I got rentals and all that stuff, but the brokerage business, I mean, there's a lot of guys in multipliers, Hatch, you, Jeff Cohn, all these guys. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Mr. Chris, uh, Chris Craddock. Craddock. I mean, yeah. they have these, you guys have these huge brokerages, you know, and they're super successful. Arnold, Chris Arnold has a brokerage down in Dallas. So it's like, that is a, a very viable model. Um, and I see a lot of benefits to that. Let me tell you, let me tell you a, a, another benefit, right? Sure. When you control the listing and when you control that market, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, those, those signs generate, those signs in the yard generate more leads, more buyer opportunities. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, for sure. And typically the agent is the referrer to the title company, to the lender, yeah. right? So what, what ultimately happens is you start being able to build an integrated real estate business where you have the ability to say, okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to add a title company. I'm going to add uh, a mortgage company. I'm going to add a construction arm. Because you are top of the funnel. Yeah, you're controlling everything. You're bringing all the business in so you can line those pillars. Oh, that's such a You can line those pillars up. So now what happens, you could start opening these other divisions or offices that are led by leaders and create opportunity. Because you're, as an agent, you're top of the funnel, right? People are going to be like, who do you know that can, who, you know, who should I use for a title company? Who should should I use for insurance? Who should I use for, and so, and you see investors do it too. I know investors will uh, own a title company and they'll yeah. pass all their business to the title company, right? But this is different. This is, this is, you know, if I have an agent, if I have a team of 25 or 100 agents and I'm telling them, hey, direct it all towards this title business. I mean, by law, you have to disclose that. Yeah, yeah. But it, but it, but you create a whole nother revenue stream, right? 100%, that comes out of it. hundred percent. Right? And it's not like you're, you're going from real estate investing to, you know, managing hedge fund money it's a similar niche it's not like you're reinventing the wheel it's like you own the mortgage company and you own the brokerage business and they're two parts of the same it's like two plus two equals four it's the same yeah. equation you know yeah and, and what i be, i believe in in partnerships right so yeah. i don't want to own that that i want to i want to have an equity stake in that business but i want somebody else to run it, so I run it. you want the who business. yeah yeah exactly totally. yeah you don't want to be caught up in all that stuff that's so yeah. smart man it's so smart so we have a lot of people listening right now. They're, they're in the flipping business. They're, they're probably some agents listening for sure with our audience. So my question for you is, and I really like bringing a lot of successful, you know, brokers on the show who have big companies. Like, if there's a real estate agent listening to this and, and they want to go from having a job to, to really being a, a legitimate self-employed person making minimum six figures a year, you know, if we have to boil it down to the, the 80, 20 and the 20% of things that they need to do to consistently earn money and build their wealth, what would you say those 20% of things are? Cause I'm sure you, I mean, you've got a big team, so you know, this inside now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it, you simplify it, right? It's uh, I love a it. real basic. There's only three ways to, to do this, right? It's you prospect, you network and you market. You start yeah. with prospecting first because it doesn't cost you any money. No, right? it's free. 
and, and then and then from there you're you're networking and then and then once you make a little bit of money you market right you market. but for me i teach everybody just this really basic 10 and 2 concept right I want to be able to talk to 10 people a day and add two people to my database a day. And if I'm doing 10 and two, right, just a basic, and it's, it's a minimum number, right? A 10 and two, yeah. right? I know that for every 50 conversations that I, I have, every, every 25 conversations that I have, I'm booking yeah. an appointment, right? Yeah, for every 12, yeah, for sure. Right? And so if I know that, then I'm just like, okay, your only job, agent, right, <laughs> is to have 10 conversations conversations yeah. a day and put two people in your database totally and over time those conversations compound and over yep. time those two people in your database compound right and before you know it you've got this database full of people that abundantly refer you right if totally. you're marketing to them properly and those conversations compound over time and business just just comes right 100 so it's not more complicated than that right but everybody wants to complicate they, they get stuck on all the other stuff like what are colors should I have? Or what did my business card look like? Or what's yeah. my website look like? And then, and then what I teach past that is like get noisy, right? And do things that that a 10 and two is a one-to-one -one type of relationship, right? I'm yeah. belly to belly. Yeah. But eventually you start understanding this concept of one to many, right? Yeah. So one to yeah. many is podcasting, it's creating video. It's like, it's, a, it's hosting seminars and events. Speaking at an event, yeah. That's right. And that's one the many. And so eventually I started learning, oh, if I need to talk to 50 people a week, right? What if I brought, what if I hosted a seminar once a week, or yeah. once a month, and I brought in 50 people? And that's when I started developing, you know, what, what I was telling you about grid, right? Grid investor. And yeah. I realized that, oh, shoot, I could host one of these every single month. And I could bring in 50 people, 100 people into my room, and we're going to talk shop about real estate because yeah. I love real estate, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, um, and that just contributed to my 10 and 2 number, right? I was like, shit, I talked to 50 people tonight. Yeah, right. You're killing two birds with one stone at the end of the day, and it's, it's easier, you know? It's easier. That's awesome. That's awesome. And that's such a practical tip because everyone looks for like this easy button. It's like if you just simplify it and do the work every day consistently. There's a book I love, Rob. I, I'm not, not sure if you've heard of it. It's called do the work by Stephen Pressfield. It's so direct. I love it. And it's just about doing the damn work. It's like, he's like, it's like, you know, 70 pages and it's just like super practical. But if you do the work every day, you will get results over time, you know, which is awesome. So, yeah. or the slight edge. Oh, right? great book. Another. Oh, yeah. That book, Compound Effect. Those little, like, what is it? It's saying small hinges swing big doors, you know? It's like, yeah, if man. you just freaking do the damn work every day over six months, you're going to make some money. It's like a mathematical probability. You know what I mean? It's, it's just math. It's, it's math. just math, dude. It's like, we all exactly. hated math. <laughs> we were, yeah. At least I did when yeah. we were younger. And now I'm like, I love I math. I love math. Yeah. I love Google spreadsheets, dude. That's amazing. <laughs> So I want to make sure we, we cover, you know, grid investor um, towards the end of our show today. I want to spend some time sure. on that. But before we get to that, Rob, I want to make sure, you know, we're, I'm respecting your time. Before we get into the grid investor, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, your rental strategy? Because I know you obviously you begin with the end of mind, you want to be a real estate buyer, not necessarily a flipper. So what, what do you do on the rental side right now? Because people love rental properties, man, because it is true. I, I mean, sure. I get checks and tenants every month and freaking I didn't have to do anything. They just paid me because I own something that's valuable. Yeah, I'll, I, you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, um, I think people learn best through mistakes. Right? Yeah, so I'll tell you what I've done wrong. Okay, and I'll tell you what I what I. Uh, so what I did wrong initially was I sold stuff because I needed the cash. Right? Yeah. And yeah. So as I've interviewed people throughout the years, as, as I've reflected on my life, every time I look back, I regret the assets that I've sold along the way. Yeah, everyone says that, man. Yeah, and because what happens is you just realize, man, you know, that asset that I thought was expensive back in the day at 220 is worth now 500, right? And totally. it, it's just like that, right? It's just this four and a half percent steady eddy, long-term appreciation, let inflation take care of it. Your tenant pays down the asset over time. Like it's it's a beautiful thing, right? Cool. But it's not a get rich quick. It's It's like- you will wake up, my friend. You're 25, right? Yeah. That's what it is, 25. You will wake up and 10 years will, would have gone by like that. Yeah, right? fast. You, you've got to be buying as much as you possibly can right now. And so what I look for is just, I want to get at least a 15% cash on cash return on my yeah. money, right? That's what yeah. I want. And, I, and if I can make those numbers, like if I can, if I can actually like, break even on these products, like even just make a little bit of positive cash flow, right? Uh, 
in 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 growth areas in growing where growth is going like yeah I, yeah because i i've owned assets in markets that on paper look really good right yep. i know exactly what you're saying okay you know what i'm saying yeah but in sure. reality tenant turnover is bad like like it, it's just it's just like but at the end of the year i call like, that a spreadsheet orgy yeah dude it looks great on paper yeah it looks great on yeah, paper until you fucking buy it <laughs> until you buy it you realize hey yeah. um I never understood. I'll tell you right now, Greg. Like I never understood why people would just shut a building down. <laughs> and now I own a build. I own a building, right? I own a triplex that I'm just shutting down, right? I'm shutting down because it's like it costs me more to operate this yep. building yep. than it does to like pay to fucking, the, yeah pay on the debt, right? So I learned a couple of things. One, you know, the some of these towns in America, you know, are are dying. Right. Yes. And and um, and being a landlord in them is not the best strategy. Owner financing. Yes. Is is a good strategy, strategy in some of those markets. Right. Yes. But being the landlord is not. Right. No. And so, you know, I, I learned that the hard way. Yeah. And um, and so what I look for is can I can I make some money at the end of the at, at the end of the month? Right. And can I get yeah. a 15 percent cash on cash return on my money? And um and I, and I gotta be honest with you. One of the other mistakes I made was in 2010, you're going to laugh at this 2011, 2012. I thought everything was overpriced because I bought at such a low number, dude. I bought, remember I was buying at pennies on the dollar in 2008 that by yeah. 2012, yeah. I was like, why would I buy that? That's right. Sorry, why would I, I buy that asset for 200 when I bought it for a buck 20 just yeah. a couple of years ago, right? But here, but the number still made sense, right? The number, the rent, the rent, the purchase ratio still made sense because of where interest rates were, right? Interest yeah. rates are a big factor in that. 100%. And so I, for a period of, I, th I think I missed a window of about seven years, right? Where I just, because I bought a lot of stuff, I, I slowed down my acquisitions and I went into this, I'm paying these suckers off as I get better at building this agent predictable revenue business, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I'm like, okay, I lost a window there of time where I could have been buying. But when's the best time to buy a house, right? Anytime. 20 years ago, when's the second best time yeah. to buy a house? Like today, yeah. right? Yeah, today. Yeah, and yeah. you could still make those numbers work. You just have to be vigilant, right? And 100%. so now I'm looking at properties in the outskirts of where we live. We're doing some, we just bought an Airbnb last year on the Shenandoah River. So you just start figuring out, hey, how, how can I do this in either markets where it does make sense or in my backyard, maybe an hour or an hour and a half away from where I live that, you know, it makes sense. It so. makes sense. That's a great strategy. And that, and you're so simple and you're clear on what you're looking for. 15% cash on cash return. And then now that could be your new baseline, your filter to evaluate opportunities with. Like yeah. you're not like, oh, I'll buy a good deal. It's like, yeah, good deal to you could be a bad deal for me, you know, depending on what we're looking after. So I That's really right. appreciate that tip. That's sure. Phenomenal advice, man. So you mentioned something earlier. I want to definitely make sure we talk about. So the grid, you know, you had me on your your podcast, and it was you. That was probably one of the best interviews I've had. Been on a decent amount of podcasts, and just the way you articulated that interview and and and, and structured it was awesome. So tell me a little bit about that, man. Yeah, I know you got some exciting stuff going on in the DMV, and now you're going to scale yeah, up you know, nationwide. It's it's fun. It's funny because I um, this thing kind of grew organically. It was it was I knew that I needed to build a database, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that uh, the more people that I know in the business, more people would bring me deals yeah. where I could lend money to and do all that stuff. And so I started kind of hosting these masterminds around real estate and real estate investing. Yeah. And I kind of set a topic. And I remember I asked myself this simple question. I said, if I was a real estate investor, if I wanted to get involved in real estate investing for the first time, what would I need to know first? Now, what would I need to know second? What would I need to know third? And what does the full life cycle of real estate investors' life look like? So that by the end of the year, right? And let's just say we've got 11 topics, 12 topics. We're talking about being the bank, right? Yeah, yeah. The goal being being the bank. So we start with wholesaling and we end with being the bank, right? Yeah. And, we, and, and in between, we've got everything else about it. And what happened is this group, this little group grew from five people to 10 to 20 to 50. Before I knew it, I had 100 people in the room and then people asking me, hey, can you host this in other areas? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I was like, hey, I'm just one guy. I can't. Yeah. So I started licensing it out to other people that had been part of my original group. Yeah. And who I taught how to do this business to. And now they were kicking ass. 
Yeah. And they wanted to, they were kind of teachers, natural teachers, and they yeah. started building their tribe. And so we've just kind of expanded that concept. And now what we've landed on is a very particular avatar. We know who's super successful running these kind of groups. We've kept, we keep refining and getting better and better. And it's your agent investor avatar, right? Meaning it's somebody like me who sees real estate from 360 because that group will generate listing deals, buyer deals, wholesale investment deals, deals yep. whole, like everything, right? Everything. And, and, um, and what I do is I just pour in the people, right? I pour in the people. We like right jab, jab, right hook. Like we give everything to everybody. We tell them, you want to know how to wholesale? Dude, I'll tell you exactly how to do it, right? Yeah. And we create what's called social equity. And then people I reward us with, with doing deals. I mean, that's it. it. We always tell everybody, listen, we're not gurus. We're going to share with you what we're doing at the local level, how we do deals, right? With the sole purpose that hopefully you bring us deals, right? We right. Do, we so want to do deals. We're just totally transparent, right? Dude, I love that freaking model, dude. And it's just like, it's like the value in advance model. Like we're going to give it all away. And if you want to do deals with us, great. If not, no sweat. We're all going to get value from this together, man. It's funny you're saying that now because 2021, dude, one of the best channels I'm getting deals from is for other investors, just networking. I'm either buying them from wholesalers or we're doing wholesale deals together and they're getting more money with me because my buyer, like it's just the same rehabbing houses. It's the whole thing, man. Wholetailing. It's the gift that keeps on giving, man. It's just provide value. Yeah, yeah you relationships. And I talk about this all the time and relationships are your best ROI. hundred percent, dude. Right? Your best ROI. The knowledge you learn from people, like 100%. the ROI is disgusting, right? Yeah. Uh, also, like I've had people that have been on my team 11 years, man, 12 years that came from this group, right? And exactly. you look at like the hundreds of thousands, the millions of dollars they've generated in business, right? Yeah. And it started because I just started by being uh, a giver. Dude. Right. That, and that's the key. You got to give, provide value, yeah. and the rest will take care of itself, man. That's amazing. That's that's, That's amazing, dude. So, so now we, you know, we just launched. We're about to launch in Scottsdale. We're in Philly. We're in, in California. We're in Florida. Uh, we're in Austin, Texas. We're in a bunch of places here in the DMV yeah, area. Yeah, major cities. Yeah. Yeah, and we and what we want to do is we want to hit all the major cities, find the right avatar that be part of our tribe of people, refer yeah. business to each other, learn from each other, and um, and and create give give people the tools and act you know the picks and access to do the business. 100 percent right. man 100 percent. that is exciting man especially you're taking it nationwide now that's that's just a smart yeah. model and it's just it's just the the whole value in advance provide a, do do the right thing have a good thing and and, and good things will come from it man that's so well, exciting you, you you actually you actually said this real fast right like great book i read it you referenced it who not how right oh dude he says amazing book right game changer book, book for me he says this thing in there that i absolutely love he says who do you want to be a hero to? Oh, I love that. Ask yourself that yeah. question, right? Yeah. Who do you want to be a hero to? And like what resonates for me is the real estate entrepreneur. That's who yeah. I want to be a hero to, right? Now, obviously, I, I, I run a real estate team. We serve the community. We help people buy and sell real estate. But that's, that's, what, we, that's what we do, right? But my yeah. passion is helping the real estate entrepreneur on this journey that we're all on, right? Totally. And I, and it's not like I'm better, you know, than, than other people. Like, I'm just, uh, I, I'm going to share with you what I know and I'm going to bring in other people that share what they know. And 100%. like, hopefully you get something from it. Right. hundred percent. And, um, and so I, you know, that, that's, that's who I want to serve as the real estate entrepreneur. I love that. And you're clear on who you can help and who your target person sure. is that you, you're very clear on that. I can tell you're a very focused person. I mean, knowing you, you know, from the, the group and hus having some conversations, man, it's, it's awesome stuff. So a couple things to wrap the show up, man. I really appreciate you coming on, man. I could talk to you for freaking hours, man. I can't wait to see you again in, in person soon. So if people wanted to reach out to your real estate team in DC, what's the best way for them to check you guys out? Yeah, I mean, they could go to uh, the Kaza, C A Z A group.com. Okay. Right? It means to hunt. The business was to hunt for properties, right? Kaza Properties was our roots. Yeah. Um, Kaza means to hunt in Spanish, right? C A Z A. It's also play on words. It sounds like house, right? Yeah, yeah, Kaza. Yeah. With a Z, it's, you know, to hunt, right? That's awesome. Um, so the Kaza group, or they can find me on Instagram. Right, just uh, at Rob Chavez. At Rob right? Chavez. They can Google me, they'll, they'll see me. What about Grid? How do they find out Grid? What's the best way? Gridinvestor.com. G R I D investor.com. Gridinvestor.com. So make sure if you're listening, you want to connect with Rob and his, his companies. 
the Casa Group, and then gridinvestor.com. I'm sure some people will be taking you up on that, man. And, and Rob, really appreciate you coming on the show, man. This has just been so much fun. I've learned a lot from this interview, and I'm, I'm sure the listeners have done so uh, as well. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, brother. Take care. Be good. Oh,